All right. Uh, last year I was in Pearl Workshop, the Pearl Workshop, and I was the only one doing, doing numerical work. And I had discussions with people about what you're doing, giving a short presentation on the stuff that I'm doing in as numerical work in Pearl. I'm using the Pearl data language the And I want to give you some ideas about what it is, how you can use it, what kind of people can use it. I give you some examples that uh, I and my company uh, use it for. Um, what I'll discuss is uh, what exists outside Pro. There's lots of other numerical works uh, that are doing some benefits of PDL versus other solutions, performance, some other uses, and then what I do myself. Uh, so first, what is PDL? PDL is an extension to Pro. Uh, I assume that you know Pro. And in PD, uh, PDL, you'll have beta, the basic storage of arrays. So the basic type in PDL is an array, which is stored in memory the way you would do it in a conventional language on C. So just basically all the bytes uh, after each other, and the basic types you have, bytes, integers, floats, doubles. Is it comparable in our sequence? I don't know. I don't know in our sequence. So. Um, usually, Perl operators are overloaded so that you can use the Perl uh, syntax, like addition, subtractions, etc., also on these arrays. Uh, the calculations are in binary speed. So basically, if you want to have an addition of these arrays, it gets uh, calculated in a, in a C coded style. And PDL itself will also distribute processing of multiple processors if they're present in your system. And uh, there are interfaces to the main numerical libraries. If you're doing science, you have uh, often the Fourier transforms of LA PEG numerical libraries that you use. and uh, PDL provides interfaces to the standard libraries. So if you have a data set and you want to convert a matrix or whatever, you can use the normal or solve uh, optimized solutions. You can use the normal numerical libraries that are present in your system. So a uh, short piece of code. I have a variable A. I assign it. I make it a PDL pin. Initialize it with two arrays. I <coughs> add two to every member of the arrays, and the output is here, an array of two by three, where you have the numbers all added by two. This, of course, is not a very interesting example, but it gives you an idea about what happens. So in this assignment, uh, the individual Perl uh, data items are taken, and they're converted into this binary format that's internal to Perl, but to PDL. So you get here an array of six uh, values, and PDL stores them. Okay, I have six values, and you should interpret it as a two by three matrix. But it's done relatively efficiently, in if those arrays would be very large. So the administration of what's in there is not any any more done on a per member basis, as it's done in a normal Perl array, but it's done on the entire array. So, you have the different data types. Uh, what's very convenient about PDL is that taking parts of the matrices or uh, transposing it, so making of a 2 by 3 matrix, 3 by 2 matrix, is all done by manipulating the administration around the data. So if I do a transpose in PDL, the basic six bytes, uh, six values stay in memory, and it's just the administration about how it should be interpreted that is adjusted. And that makes it for large matrices very efficient in terms of memory, because you don't copy data, and it makes it very rapid because only the administration is updated. You can really easily redimension it. So if I have those six values and I want to have the matrix one by six or six by one, you just tell PDL update administration and you can do, do it. 
and that's convenient if you want to do uh, uh, all kinds of Fourier, uh, do Fourier transforms on part of the data, or if they have different meanings. Uh, most numerical libraries are there, matrix multiplicational. That's that's uh, that's in the core of PDL, but solve uh, <coughs> finding optimum uh, values, so minimizing problems or uh, matrix inverts are, are used by uh, by matrix inversion. Um, what they use it often for is that they use uh, Perl hashes to recode the values. Uh, into numerical values, into array indices, so that they can do my calculations uh, in a matrix form in PDL, but all the I.O. I can do in the info. There's a very good introduction to, to really what's under, uh, what's inside PDL on uh, protv.org. It's an hour long, all the internals of how PDL works. I don't want to cover it here because I just want to give you a list of what's possible rather than tell you, okay, you can do it this way, you have an example with code, this way you transpose it, this way you calculate it. Other solutions. Um, basically, the things I'm doing is numerical calculation, so it's basically what scientists do. And in the 80s, it was all Fortran and Pascal, which were the languages of that moment, which were really only had, which really only had this Numerical data types. Those they are very poor at string handling, at I/O, and all that. C C++ took over uh, in the 90s in science, but still, uh, string manipulations, recoding things is a hassle. Um, you see a lot of solutions based on the uh, MATLAB uh, or the open source equivalent of TAF uh, in science. Those, uh, those languages have very concise ways to do the, all the operations. You can really write in few lines of codes uh, what you want. But PDL, in the end, doesn't need any more lines. However, I found MATLAB very constrained in uh, the way to import external data and to export it to, ta uh, to data types you want. Perl is way more versatile than that. <coughs> Of course, we have the mathematical max, uh, maxima thing where you do uh, symbolic manipulation that's completely different to ballpark. And what you see now is that in science there is a lot of uh, Python and NumPy. What you see is that, for example, astronomy has built large libraries based on Python. And so that's in a lot of science fields the, uh, the way that, that science has gone. Uh, what you see is that. Well, uh, Perl and PDL are faster, but the li libraries, uh, and not many libraries are built on top of that for the different uh, user groups. If you uh, using the work that Wolfram is doing on uh, universal definition language, for example, I haven't. <laughs> is that is that Wolfram is, is using the yes. same No, no. Yeah, uh, he's, he's the creator of Mathematica, mm -hmm. and uh, there, uh, oh, yeah. he's also made this search engine, so he's doing a lot of good stuff. Okay. The thing that I'm mostly uh, involved in is taking data from databases and companies, trying to match things, and what I found is that uh, half of my work is cleaning up uh, data with errors in it, and that uh, those universal languages aren't very good at uh, having databases which from version to version have different fields, different definition, all that. And that Perl is fairly, fairly good in gluing those things together. I miss SPSS in the US. But I asked because yesterday I was uh, importing some data into SPSS and I wonder if what we are going to do there is to do as a PDF. Oh, uh, I I know people doing that. Maggie X is doing that. All the stuff that you would do in SPSS, do it in PDL. Um, I'm not sure if the the, the t tests and the, the normal SPSS tests there should be libraries for it, but I'm not aware of that because that's not the, the stuff that I'm doing. I know that PDL is very fast because it's hot memory. 
Um, for unclean data, I really love Perl. If, if there's something coming in your input and you need to reconfigure things or if, if data columns are differently, you have all that stuff. Ashes in memory is great. And PDL has a great own way of handling binary files. So if you just have binary files going from some source, for example, a, a wave, an audio file, you can really easily import that and it's all in PDL. Um, as far as performance, I'm very uh, pleased by Perl PDL. Perl is really fast in text handling, in putting things into hashes, concatenating things. Uh, there are some benchmarks where you see that the Perl is even faster than C, C++ plus plus and that. It's really bad and very good in that. And the PDL performance is also very good because uh, of the way that the loops are implemented in uh, or even source code, it's very optimized in memory usage <coughs> and in, uh, in speed of processing speed. And it also can uh, uh, use your different processors in your system in order to load level. So as far as performance, I'm very pleased with this solution. So you said that it does things quite lazily, so if you multiply everything by two, then it just uh, puts it in the administration and says, okay, these values have to be interpreted by a factor two, but then no, no, it's not, not multiplication, okay. the ordering. So you have, uh, you have your memory, the values. Yeah. So if you add two to it, yeah. what it will do, actually, is <coughs> if you take array, find two processors to take both the half of the array and do the, uh, all the additions in memory. Yeah. However, if I say uh, it's not uh, uh, two by three, but it's just six values because I want to have the average of it or whatever, then uh, reordering it, so just changing the administration of those values, so not changing the values, but changing okay. the layout. It's, it's so if you multiply everything by two, then it, it really does to get there. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's done. Um, um, there are a couple of data stacks that are known. I've taken this from uh, the PDL uh, Perl.org uh, uh, site. Uh, there is a nice uh, program that plots the pollutions in different European cities. And uh, uh, the original developers of PDL coming, are coming from uh, astronomy and astrophysics. So there's a lot of stuff done there where people actually made their calculation for scientific papers in PDL. Um, uh, what I do in my company is that I'm uh, focused on the rail sector. So what we are doing is we are providing consultancy uh, services to the rail sector. What I have there is data sets like uh, number of travelers in each train in the Netherlands for the last couple of years, so that's very many data points, and then uh, uh, forecasting how many travelers there will be in every train, or uh, evaluating how much power all the electric trains in the Netherlands have used based on speed profiles and times that they were in certain sections. Uh, in order to do that, I need to split up my data easily, and what I myself use there is uh, the main facility of the Unix uh, system, which can uh, put different jobs at different processors and let all the different. Uh, I usually make small jobs which run for something like 15 minutes and then collect all the data together. So, what do I do? Passenger forecasts. Up till uh, February, all the forecasts for how many people there are in the trains. Uh, we're based on calculations that I've done. So what we've taken there is uh, people that pass through the trains and counted the number of people. Uh, we have a couple of trains where uh, the amount of kilos of passengers is weighed, and, and we convert it into number of field passengers. And we use the chip car data in order to forecast uh, how many people there would be in, in the next train. Because we have all these different data sources, uh, it was very convenient to use Perl, but then the calculations are done in memory uh, in the data language. Uh, I have a little paper on that in the, in the Dutch journal Stato. 
another thing that uh, I'm evaluating is the, the amount of energy usage by the Dutch currents. And this is a graph that we use internally. Um, we have a baseline in the beginning of 2000, we had no savings in energy. And as for, uh, from 2010 onwards, we are training all the drivers of Dutch trains to drive more efficiently. So what they'll do is they'll speed up first and then switch off the engine and let it roll out to be exactly in time at the end stage. Um, I am doing the monitoring for that. So for each of the groups of drivers in the Netherlands, so the Netherlands is split into say 10 regions, uh, I determine how much savings they have as compared to the beginning of 2010. And so you see that uh, on the average it's in the order of magnitude of 3%, which is a real lot of money. Uh, but certain groups of drivers are even better at saving energy than others. And so what I'm doing each month is really calculating how uh, efficiently all the drivers have uh, driven their uh, the trains and reporting that back. And this is used as management information for the managers of these groups and their really steering that the drivers drive efficiently. Do you get feedback from drivers that uh, drive very efficiently? So they the train on Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have a couple of people that are uh, the front runners. So what you see here is that this this group actually are the 20 people that we have very close to the central organization on eco driving, and they are actually developing new ways also for the other drivers in, in order to improve their performance. Now they are also committed to the project. Yeah. This is grouped by region. Can it be that it might be easier to drive uh, more eco-friendly or uh, using less energy on certain uh, areas? Yeah. It's normalized on where they drive, on the routes, and we see that it has more to do with management attention than anything else. <laughs> Is that also what happened in August? It's normalized from 2009. I see uh, it all. It's an increase in uh, savings starting in August. Oh, uh, we, we've done... Uh, Is that management uh, interaction? Or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've, been certain, we've been training all the drivers ah, and uh, we thought that it would help. It didn't a lot and at a certain moment we have presented to the management which had this target in the target letter that it was very unlikely that they would reach the target. <laughs> And as managers go, they reacted to that. <laughs> and some managers more than others. <laughs> and they often squeeze more passengers into a uh, uh, more random path. Uh, that, 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 that's the other perfect <laughs> way. This, this is really about how you drive yourself. So how you the echo you're to the captain. Uh, other thing that I'm doing is uh, monitoring the amount of time it takes for passengers to walk over a station. So this is an example graph of uh, the station of here in Utrecht, where we have at zero the time that a, time, uh, a train arrives, and here the amount of minutes that it takes for the people to reach uh, the end of the station. It's also based on the chip car data. And what we see see here is that there are two platforms. It's platform 18B and 19B, where the travelers take a lot more time in order to reach the, the, the end of the station. Those platforms are a very long way uh, from the center part of the station. And we're using this in order to optimize the station and to rearrange platforms and to understand what's happening with the travelers. They're yeah. actually listening to you because the station is all a mess now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they are listening or they are not listening? Uh, <laughs> it will take five years to reopen. <laughs> they are changing things for the for good or for worse, uh, no. I don't know. But, but this is a good one from the going to the center. This will get a new platform, uh, platform finding, which is a new platform which will go uh, on the local area, so this will improve. We know that this is a temporary uh, situation. Je bent er vijf minuten over tijd in. Dat vindt wij heel gezellig hoor. Dus uh, <laughs> <laughs> kost zou dat niet spreken. So my uh, summary is, uh, I enjoy using 
Thank you for your attention. Oh, Zo snel of toch niet? Vragen. <laughs> dat is wel interessant. Dus, ja. Er zijn er vragen? Ja, dan, dus je had de extension library. Oh, uh, extension libraries. Uh, you wrote something yourself for this, but it was on the BioPro. Yeah, there's there's BioPro which uses PDL. So yeah. what you see is these are very dedicated projects that are not really transferable. I do this for a builder company and that's it. Mm -hmm. But if you have a bigger community, for example, uh, there's lots of uh, things in genetics or whatever where there are many researchers working. What you need there is really on top of PDL, basic data library, basic libraries to read basic data from a stage in order to improve their algorithms. Mm -hmm. And you see that the Python community is now way stronger in supporting groups that are building things on the mm -hmm. than the PDL community is. So the, the way to go is uh, to be compatible with uh, Python Pro, have importance for that. And, um... No, no it's not really, because it's also the algorithms you write in the language that you want to transfer and modify. Mm -hmm. And I found that, that for me, PDL works great. Mm -hmm. But you, you, in order to really catch on, you need larger and larger groups that actually use it. And what I see now is individuals enjoying it, but not really broad communities where you say, well, we as those hundred or two hundred or thousand researchers are using I never see them on conferences at all. Universities teach Python and Apple. Yeah. Yeah, so in my university, uh, all the physics students are taught Python. Is it that you use in optics as well? Because optics use really large matrices. Yeah, you can use it. A lot of transference. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of use, uh, people using that. I mean, this is basically just, uh, just mathematical uh, language. I needed this 20 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> and what you see is there are great packages and models for that. Yeah. Once those packages are there, that really defines what you're doing. But it also defines the limitations of what you can do. Yeah. Is it possible to use uh, GPU uh, acceleration? I haven't seen. I think problem. it should be possible. I'm not aware of that. So it's not, okay. not a yes or a no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.